KLTV Soundcheck, KLTV Soundcheck.
Welcome everyone to the Tuesday morning meeting of the BOCC. If uh, you can, you want to rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the two of the public, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, I'll ask Commissioner Mortensen to give us a review of the minutes. Yes, you know, I just thought about the game show hosts that go year after year after year with the same statements. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I reviewed the minutes of the activities last week and I moved to approve those minutes. We have a motion to approve the minutes. Any questions, comments, corrections? Not seeing any, not seeing any online. So I'll call for a vote. Those in favor? Aye. I also vote aye. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll run down through the consent agenda. Uh, one thing I will mention, we do have a public hearing at 930 today. So I'll be cognizant of that uh, as we move through. Consent agenda, call for bids. We have a call for bid for Kalama River Road Culvert Replacement Project. Uh, it's located between milepost 2.02 and 2.06. Uh, that call for bid scheduled out for May 8th, 2024. Agreements, contracts, bid awards. We have an agreement with the city of Kelso in January. Uh, we workshopped a, a request from Kelso to help with one of their local parks or Lad Lassie's parks. Uh, we came to agreement to, to try and help them with that. And this is uh, uh, the written agreement is now we're approving here. Warranty deed and temporary easement for wide array purposes on our South Cloverdale realignment project. I think we're getting close on that one to having everything in, in, that we need to get going. And then we completed the annual certification with the County Road Administration Board. They call it CRAB. Uh, under board correspondence, we have quite a few uh, uh, Letters, a lot of it's uh, reappointment to committees, the homeless homeless housing task force was busy this past month. So uh, Trista Junker, Junker Rodman has been appointed to the homeless housing tax force two year term through April of 2026. Um, Matt, uh, Simers, Simers, Going to Southwest Washington Workforce Development Council. Term runs through June of 2027. Christine Grubbs appointed to the Veterans Advisory Board. That runs through October of 2028. Eric Halverson appointed to the Homeless Housing Task Force. Uh, runs through April of 2026. Ruth Kendall reappointed to the Homeless Housing Task Force. Runs through April of 2026. Courtney Russell reappointed to the Homeless Housing Tax Force, runs through April of 2026. Uh, Brent Harris reappointed to the Homeless Housing Tax Force, runs through April of 2026. And Eric McCrandall reappointed to the Homeless Housing Tax Force, that uh, runs through April of 2026. You might want to stagger these dates, Gina. <laughs> <laughs> And then vouchers in the amount of $1,080,815.94. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point out that the appointment of Matt Seamers is to the uh, Southwest Washington Workforce Development Council. He's the new president of LCC, and they've traditionally had a position representing the county and education on that board. So he's replacing Chris Bailey. Perfect. Hopefully I didn't butcher his name nope, too bad. No. <laughs> also, um, your comment about staggering the dates reminds me that the current chair, current chairman of the uh, housing task force is Courtney Russell, and her term had 
her term had been expired for at least a few months, but we carry on anyhow. So it's yeah. like, maybe it doesn't matter, but I agree with you. I just thought it was cute that the chairman had expired <laughs> term. Yeah. Most, most of these volunteer positions have a very useful little phrase. They serve until the end of their term or until their successor is appointed and that gives them the legal authority to, to keep serving. We do we, we do expect them to s submit the forms for reappointment, so. Yeah. But our, our uh, clerk of the board has been very good at keeping us up to date on that. Okay, any other questions on consent? I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve today's consent agenda as presented by staff. I have a motion to approve. Any questions, comments? I'm sorry, I'm not knowledgeable about the task force, um, homeless housing task force. I'd like to know the, um, the requirements to be on this task force, the um, responsibility of the task force, the authority the task force has, and what possibly do they do? What, what uh, do they do for the community? The... The one part is relatively easy to answer. What, there are some constraints as to uh, uh, the members at large versus members specifically, presumably representing, or they come from an area. So City of Longview, for example, has now Eric Halverson and Ruth Kendall on there uh, by statue, we, we have a single person that comes from the city of Longview at the request of the council, I guess, or the, the council says, this is the individual that we want you to, cons to consider. And I use the term consider because ultimately anybody gets appointed, gets appointed by the board. It's it's it is our choice, and each of us have our own algorithm by which we decide whether we want someone on there. Uh, and uh, for myself, I uh, I stalled long enough that I knew Gina would probably yeah. come up to feel the rest of it. Oh, for, awesome! Hi, Gina. <laughs> for myself, I I use a metric. I I want somebody that has original ideas. If I can possibly determine that, I would like to cycle more people through the board if that's possible. Uh, so given an applicant and a reappointment applicant, I might, I would typically be biased toward the new applicant. It's just really want the people to continue to get involved and see how things actually happen so you've heard us talking an awful lot about the document recording fees that the state has us collect and they keep half of it and we get to spend half of it on addressing homelessness and uh, affordable housing that same law requires a homing and housing uh, uh, homing and housing task force for the county for the purpose of developing a five-year plan on addressing those issues so we can't spend that money on any on any project or activity that's not included in the the five year plan. Interestingly, when the law was first adopted over a dozen years ago, um, it it stated that it was the goal was to end homelessness. And after the first five years, they said, "Oh, this is not happening. Um, the, the problems are far too complex." So they changed it. We have to address housing or homelessness and affordable housing and so two different issues I, so, I so these these folks then work on our behalf um, 
uh, updating that, keeping it current uh, according to as things change. And um, there, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, and the size varies. I mean, there's not a set. You don't have to have seven or four or three. I think it, ha it can have up to fifteen. That's the the membership. Membership, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then we do have a few designated categories that we try to have. For example, Brett Harris is from the sheriff's office and mm -hmm. um, represents county government since law enforcement has a an important role in and some of some of the activities that go on <clears throat> with particularly with the homeless. Well, I see, but um, the public isn't privy to the information that you've just given to me. What they read is what's happened in the homeless camp, which has maybe a total of 13 inhabitants during the summer. And even lately, uh, people have been told there's not that many that are living there. And also there's stabbings, there's overdoses. So right now, I'm not saying that I do, but I'm saying that the public now has a very negative very negative view of of the homeless camp. And so I wanted that's why I'm asking what the task force, what the plan is, what they what authority they have, how, you know, how can we make this our homeless situation better? Because right now it doesn't from the public view, it's not working. And that's why I asked the questions. And and I'm sorry, I I, I don't want to be so negative, but is there another alternative plan? Is there something else that needs to be done? Um, maybe a different way of going about getting people to want to be clean and helping the ones that do want to be clean. Is there another way to go about it that maybe hasn't been hasn't been tried? Um, I mean, there's a lot of different things that that communities can try. Um, going back to your question about the task force, um, they, their primary purpose, as Commissioner Weber mentioned, is to give input on the development of the five-year plan to address homelessness for the county. Um, that's posted on our Health and Human Services website if anyone wants to take a look at it. We are starting the process of, um, we'll, we'll have to have an updated plan developed um, in the next year. So we're starting that work with the task force right now. The required membership on the task force, um, it can have up to 15 members, but there are three required membership places. One is a county representative, a representative from the largest city within the county, which is the city of Longview, uh, and then an individual with lived experience, so someone who has previously been homeless before. Um, that's the required membership. Outside of that, it's at large. Um, so that's their primary focus is the development of that plan. And then that gets elevated to the Board of County Commissioners as a tool to use when they're considering funding decisions with document recording fees. Primarily, we've been um, focused on affordable housing in this last year. So there's been a lot of um, investment towards affordable housing units in the community. Um, so that's their primary role. Um, certainly, there can be other interventions that the community might be interested in, um, and that would be interesting discussion um, to have. Okay, well, thank you for answering. I, I, I appreciate those, those, that information. My, I guess my question is, I've uh, been listening to people who represent private enterprises that uh, are trying to help, and I don't see them being used as much as I think they should be. I don't understand why not. Um, and like I said, I personally have received some negative feedback about the homeless camp. And then, of course, the reported things that are in the paper. And somehow that had, I mean, I I'm as frustrated. I mean, I'm sure you're just as frustrated as I am or anybody else. And and um, to have people want to to uh, improve them, their their success rate, you might say, would be really hard. And I understand that totally. Um, I was just maybe hoping, I know you're, you've got the three requirements, but would that plan be open to more community input? Maybe somebody that hasn't, didn't have those three requirements might have a, a spark of brilliance come through where it, it just something that hasn't been tried before, because it, it just appears that we were doing the same things over and over again. And they're just not working, not working well enough. I'm sorry, I 
I don't be, I'm sorry, I don't need to be negative, but that's okay. And if there's, if anyone wants to come and share their thoughts with the task force, they are open, um, okay. public meetings, the meeting schedules posted on our website. Um, so you can see when the meetings are, um, and they typically are, you know, the, at the meetings are pretty flexible, then they allow individuals to come and share and, um, that what they're be, thinking. That would be good. And I'd like to have the, the more, the public, more public input, because I really think that somewhere out there, there is an answer because mm -hmm. right, like I said, um, we just seem to be doing the same thing over and over again, but that's just my opinion. Thank you. If I could comment on that. Um, I typically sit in on the homeless housing task force and I'm not a member of the board. I just sit there and for the most part, it's been interesting because what you say pretty much describes what happens uh no real no new ideas and not maybe there aren't any but it's the same repeat and over the nation we have spent billions and billions of dollars on on this problem and to think that our little group is going to come up with something like that really implies that if we do it's because we think outside the box that there's something else we can do but that is typically a very hard sell. Most people think like uh, some of the discussions included rent control for their s subsidies, uh, all kinds of things that have been tried many times over and all failed. Fundamentally, people think you can throw a few dollars at it or a lot of dollars at it and it'll solve the problem. And we know that doesn't work. But I can tell you that I've gotten a sense of uh, renewed enthusiasm. The new chairman is asking a lot of the right pertinent questions. I think you and she would sit down and say, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, now it's up to the board members to try and answer that honestly. Uh, one of the problems I have frequently, a lot of board members, it's like a carpenter that only has a hammer, everything's a nail. And then you want to be careful that you don't fit in that category, you know, that you really have to look outside and you have to look also. I'll, I'll say it in a way, hopefully not to anger too many people, but if, if a doctor does not if, she, if a doctor does not desire absolute cure of all diseases because of fear of being unemployed, that's the kind of thing I'm concerned about. A doctor should always behave as if he can cure the world. And we want people who don't take a look at their own pocket or their own special interests, but want to cure the world. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Also vote aye. Okay, motion items. Go ahead and just another reminder. It's 9.30 in my message. Okay. We have a public meeting. Go ahead, Gina. Okay, thank you. Gina James, Health and Human Services. The item we have on the agenda today is a contract with Housing Opportunities of Southwest Washington. This contract um, is a cost reimbursement up not to exceed $133,250 for the calendar year 2024. Um, this contract is to provide um, supportive housing and case management services at a program called the Phoenix House. This is um, some units uh, that are available to individuals who complete uh, inpatient or residential treatment program and are integrating back into the community and continuing with their outpatient programs. So the case management and support help to uh, work with the individuals on self-sufficiency, planning, looking at employment, continuing their treatment, all of those things to help them stay on track and integrate back into the community. Um, oftentimes with their children. Um, we have a couple of staff from Housing Opportunities here with us today. If we 
want to have them come and share a little bit about the program, a little bit more about um, what they hope to do. Historically, this project has been a partnership with Housing Opportunities and Calitz Family Health Center. And Calitz Family Health Center has always um, done this role of providing the case management services on site. Um, they've chosen to back out of that this year and Housing Opportunities was willing to take that piece on to be able to continue that support for those individuals. Um, so this, this piece is new for Housing Opportunities, but the project certainly isn't. So um, I'm happy to invite them up to share a little bit more if you'd like to hear more. So if I remember correctly, um, Phoenix House is specifically available for mothers who've lost custody of their children because of problems with drugs. They've gone through drug court, have successfully completed the treatment, and and the research has shown that transition back into independent living is a very difficult step if you don't have an intervention. That is, they go back to the old environment that encouraged their use of drugs. I mean, and so this gives them a clean start, hence the use of the image, the phoenix, that comes back alive uh, again. And, and I know over the years, we've had some tremendous reports about the successful reunification of families and the successful um, uh, transition from Phoenix House on, into employment and, and jobs. I'm, I'm assuming that goes, but it is interesting. One of the key elements that is mentioned is this intervention with case managers, that usually doesn't happen in an apartment house. But with this particular clientele, they have somebody to go to, to help work out a plan, to help give them the kinds of encouragement that they need. Um, what I'm curious to know is what is what may be changing to make the program even stronger. And, and uh, ladies, uh, be, yeah. be glad to have you come up to, to share with us that latest. Wherever. Okay. So my name is Rochelle Sanders, and I am coming from you from Housing Opportunities of Southwest Washington. Um, Katie Bonus. I'm the director of operations for Housing Opportunities. So, I my current position is um, I manage all of our supportive services and our supportive services div division at Haswa, and we we are making several changes. Um, historically, Phoenix House has been for mothers with their children, and we've made that invite open to men and their children as well um, to add those additional services. There's 20 pods, 20 um, units at Phoenix House. There's in separate, there's five different pods open and available. And one of those will be designated for men that are reunifying with their children and um, working with drug court and hope court. We've added a, a lot of services on site at Phoenix House. Um, the first being our rent well tenant education program, bringing services on site to where our population already feels safe and comfortable and in an environment that they trust. Um, allows them to still continue working full time, further their education, and be there with their children um, at the Phoenix House location. So, along with Rentwell, we work on credit building, repair. We work on, you know, financial literacy, parenting classes. We're hoping to bring on site. Um, other, you know, substance use support groups bring things to the parents that are working really hard on all of those goals. Um, in our proposal, we have asked to add an additional half-time case manager. Historically, it's always been one full-time case manager on site providing those services. And those are during business hours. And for us to allow those parents to continue working full-time and not interrupt their work schedules as they reintegrate into the community, we would like to add an additional case manager half time in the evenings to help provide those supportive services to them. Um, be there in the evening times. We're also on call 24 hours for crises. You know, we it, it is intensive services that we provide to give the support that they need when they need it. All right. When uh, and it's been a while when you came in and sit down and chatted. You had some numbers of how many people you you've run through there. Do you still? Oh, I don't have it with me. Because um, I, I know it's not, it's not a permanent solution. You, you, 
you're working to get them to a point where they're out on Correct. your own and you had yeah. some numbers and it's it's communal living and i apologize for not bringing those numbers with me um phoenix house opened in 2009 and I mean, the, the goal is to integrate them back into society and get them hooked up with it, whatever services they can outside also. Uh, we encourage them to get on any wait list that's open for subsidies. We have quite a few of them that give vouchers from either our housing authority, Kelso Housing Authority, so that they can move on. Um, in almost 25 years, I, I wish I had the number with me, but We've, we've helped a, a great deal of people through that complex. How long would you say the average um, stay? The average stay, boy, it varies. Um, probably average, we get people that stay there for a good five years. They get mm -hmm. employment, they start bringing in their income, and services works with them to get them into the community, into their own place, and that frees up an additional spot where somebody else is coming out of treatment so that they can take part in the services also. So earlier this morning, we had somebody challenge us about persistent homelessness. Uh, does the Phoenix program uh, help divert people from homelessness? Is, is it one of the effective programs? Yes. Because contrary to what, what is a perception out there, Phoenix House is one of many programs that that work in this community, addressing a whole variety of different causes of homelessness. This one in particular has, has a particular clientele. That is correct. Uh, the folks are exiting drug treatment programs, continuing on with their outpatient treatments. Um, they've kind of taken that first step into the getting help. And supportive services are there at Phoenix House to make sure that they continue on that path to recovery. Thank you. So bottom line, pretty much what I'm seeing is this is a renewal of a contract we've been doing for quite some time. We just have new, we're having new people run the program and, and uh, they're adding some of their own touches to it. Yeah. Normally, Gina, you have the source of the funds that we use on the grant. Has that changed? And and which which uh, funding source are we using? Have we used and, and what are we using with this one? Yes. So this project has actually been funded a couple of different ways over the last several years. Um, originally started with mental health tax and then transitioned to document recording fees a couple of years ago. Because it is more of a housing project um, treatment, of course, but it is a housing project. Um, so we plan to use document recording fees. We did, as as we did with some of our other contracts this year, um, a few weeks ago, we added some of the reference to the state contract as well, so that if there's um, opportunity, or if there's just to have that flexibility that we could potentially use some of those funds um, instead of local document recording fees. And these kinds of supportive services are listed in the five-year plan that the task force is uh, recommended right yes one of the interventions that's listed in the plan great thank you yeah. so just so as not to confuse people i'll be happy to make the motion for the contract but i, I i'd like to throw in some perspective uh when uh, all of us experience that uh, when we go into a store or a store which we are, with which we're unfamiliar we get sort of an ambiance of, I really want to shop here, or uh, I don't want to shop here. And so uh, I've toured all of Housewas stuff, and it, it meets my metric there of, is, the, uh, is that a store I want to shop in? Is, is there an honest intent? I had mentioned earlier trying to get people out and work yourself out of a job. And I, I feel that that's the attitude certainly coming down from the top. Uh, Jennifer Westerman does a spectacular job. Also, uh, Phoenix House addresses a situation wherein people go through a legal system of some kind and, uh, 
get cured until they go back to the environment in which they were, and then they get uncured, and we repeat this cycle. This is true for people that are that are coming out of jail, also. So it it it, it does it does handle that. I, I I typically am appalled by the abuse of uh, government programs. It's not my money. What do I care? And uh, when you go through house law tours, you see things are well kept, and there's no sense at all that somebody's trying to just get themselves a job with no with no interest in the outcome. And so I, I that's why I, I I'm going to be happy to make the motion. Um, I will say, be careful in all this discussion. We are absent discussing the costs, and we're absent discussing other things that are actually in the uh, in the legislature. So, uh, while this may this is a good thing for individuals, overall the problem of homelessness isn't going away because this is simply at the end of the line of a whole bunch of bad attitudes. And uh, uh, the job Phoenix House is doing is, like I say, excellent, but we haven't really tackled the problem. It's like we're, we're fixing someone after the damage has been done, and uh, we can do better, I think, in stop the damage before it gets done. But that's a very long story, and the nation struggles with that. Um, so I want to say I appreciate that you come to talk to us. Thank you. And entertain a motion if you're ready. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve contract number 24-6 016 Housing Opportunities of Southwest Washington, as we have discussed. Okay. We have a motion to uh, approve. Any other comments, questions, comments? Quick check online. Not see any. Call for a vote. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. I also vote aye. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll we'll jump a little bit here and go because I know we have the public hearing. So we'll we'll move in to that and then uh, pick back up with the other agenda item after. Good morning, commissioners, members of the public. Uh, Savannah Clement, Deputy Director of Public Works. And I have with me today, Jason Jellum, and he is our fleet er &R supervisor. Um, before you today, we have a list of um, surplus items, uh, mostly vehicles, equipment, if not all. Um, and what we've done is compiled this list using a lot of indicators from mileage, hour utilization, year, and then, and then of course, condition of the, the piece of equipment as well. Um, so we would like to bring it to the board today for approval to surplus these. Uh, I kind of think of it as an accounting process. Um, we're essentially getting these pieces of equipment off of our books, um, but we're hoping to get some money back on them through um, the auction process, or um, in some cases, um, having other county departments utilize them for their own needs, um, for, you know, expo, um, conference center divisions like that could maybe utilize some of these. Um, so we're here today to um, review, discuss, and ask for approval. We did have a workshop uh, last week and went over the, the lists in uh, pretty good detail. And I appreciate the process that's gone on. I think uh, Commissioner Mortensen and I noticed that the age of the vehicles, uh, the number of uh, miles being um, used as a measure has gone up, right? And, you know, uh, regular and prompt maintenance, of course, extends the life of vehicles. But, but of course, accidents do happen and we get vehicles totaled, especially, I, I think we had, what, three of the sheriff's vehicles that got totaled. And Correct. We're going to salvage what we can out of uh, auctioning off the, the hulks, right? Yes. Um, yep. So I appreciate the work that's been done. But I know our, my, my questions are answered on that. 
any other questions on this? We, like you said, like Commissioner said, we went over it pretty thoroughly in the workshop. These things, we send them to auction house or we transfer them to a Correct. different department, whatever mm -hmm. the use works best for us. I think it's fair to say that public works put, puts in a fair amount of effort to collect proper data and make judicious decisions. And I like the fact that some vehicles can be moved to other areas, including there's one that went to search and yes. search and rescue. Mm -hmm. We do have yeah. one that's transferring to search and rescue. Yeah. The only thing I don't like is if it goes to auction, there's an auction fee. Of course, they've looked at that and the auction fee is fairly slim, but I would like anybody in the public, of, particularly of Cowlitz County, to be able to buy one of those surplus items without having to pay a third party for doing so. However, Public Works is not in the retail business <laughs> and it, it would be just a bit hard to make that leap. Yeah. And I think it probably um, is a good reminder to point out that with our vehicle repair program, we have pretty uh, exacting uh, accounting standards to make sure that those vehicles purchased with road tax dollars don't get spun off into other departments without the, the, the appropriate uh, expenditures being made. So the road fund gets reimbursed if, if uh, a vehicle they purchased is used by another department, just because the law requires that the road tax goes only for road construction and repair and maintenance. Yes. And I think absolutely. in a few bridges too. A couple. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from us? I'll I open public hearing for public comment. If there is any on this. Yes. Yeah. Seeing none, close public comment. Then, Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the excuse. We approve the resolution declaring vehicles and equipment surplus and approve for disposal among. Uh, according to the county property management plan. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Any last chance for comment? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Also vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll head back to motion items, human resources. Good morning, Commissioners, Jessica Warren, Human Resources. Before you this morning, I have a three-year collective bargaining agreement from January 1st, 2024 to December 31st, 2026 between Cowlitz County and our Sheriff Specialist Guild. This agreement covers 15 employees in both our Law Enforcement Records Department and then various Sheriff's support positions within the office. Financial changes in this collective bargaining agreement include for 2024, a 4% cost of living increase, plus a salary reclassification to their step schedule going from 10 steps to nine steps. In 2025, a 3% cost of living increase. And in 2026, a CPI equivalent cost of living increase with a floor of 1.5% and a ceiling of 3.5%. Increases to the employer contribution to county insurance in the first year by $200 a month, and then a $50 a month increase each year consistent with our other groups at the county. In 2024, the total amount would be $1,850 a month, 2025, $1,900, and 2026, $1,950. This Collective bargaining agreement also includes the ability to use a second floating holiday after six months. Previously, it was after 10 years and an additional bonus leave day after 20 years employed. Along with 
these financial changes, there were various other language changes um, centering around the previous contract. They were two separate groups, so they're combined now. So we had to do a lot of cleanup language in the bargaining group and then updated language for the 24-7 records division for overtime call-in procedures and scheduling procedures. You've been busy uh, negotiating a lot of different contracts this year, and this looks pretty consistent with past ones yes. we've been doing. Yeah. Uh, how many total uh, <coughs> days off, paid days off, uh, does an employee receive? So in this contract, in this contract, and this is similar for most of the county. So they earn one day of sick leave, one day of vacation each month that they're here, a maximum of 248 hours of vacation and a maximum of 1200 hours of sick leave can be accrued. And then there's 13 paid holidays along with two floating holidays. So on average, can you total that up for me? I don't want to embarrass myself. Um, so 13 plus 12, in the year for vacation type leave. 25. 25. And then there's also bonus accruals that you earn along with the years of service. And uh, the six month, the 10 year did not became six month. Was there a substitute for the 10 year? Uh, no, we've just, it's difficult to track on our end because PeopleSoft allows you to use floating holidays. So we've been moving in the direction of just allowing the two years or the two floating holidays up front for all of our groups. This is just our last group that didn't have this. And uh, the number of 25 days, is that start the first day of employment that is i at the end of my first year i have 25 days correct that's including the holidays that you would have right there thank you thank you so 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 10 of those uh, vacation days are holidays that have to be have to be taken on the day that the holiday is correct right? yes but in terms of a a family vacation where they want want to take one or two or three weeks off there there's a maximum that they can bank yeah they, there's a maximum that they can bank of 240 hours in the first year they would earn 12 days the um insurance benefit the health insurance cost to us the contribution that we make has typically been fifty dollars uh, um increases each year for the monthly fee so we've watched it i think when i first first came it was about 1250 and now it's you you've described terms that where we're going to be reaching 2000 and uh, of course uh, many many costs from insurance companies just continue to go up and virtually all employees if they have full family coverage are also contributing money to health insurance is that right? Yes. Any given plan that we have, the employee can expect to contribute $0 for our lowest cost HSA plan up to about $600 a month. Yep. Okay, thank you. The cost of living increase was set at 3% for this year. Is it, did, I, did I hear that? 4% for this year and 3% for next four, year. Four for this year and then three for the out years. Yeah. So, so it'll be interesting to see if inflation comes back down under control. It's still, still higher than three percent. So, it is uh, yes. For some reason, it reminds me of something I won't go into, but uh, the CPI is a number that is very interesting, very insignificant from a practical standpoint, because it gets redefined, it gets defined for particular areas. Anyhow, uh, would you like a motion, Mr. Chairman? 
I, I move that we approve the collective bargaining agreement with Sheriff's Specialist Guild as has been presented by staff. Okay. We have a motion to approve. Any comments? We can open yeah. it. Yeah. You're asking questions about the contract. Yes, okay. that's correct. Um, did you say they have 12 days sick leave a year? Correct, yes. What is the state mandate on sick leave for private sector? It's one hour for every 40 hours earned. What would that accumulate in a year? I... Isn't it six man days a year? Six days a year? Six man days. Same thing. The state leave requires that you earn one hour for every 40 hours you work. So I believe that would be more than six days a year. I got friends that have businesses and they have to provide six days of sick leave for a year. Why should we be paying more and putting it on the burden of the taxpayers and, uh, and giving this stuff to these folks? You got to earn it before you get it. And why should why should the taxpayers pay somebody that's supposed to be performing a community service and they're getting a better deal than the folks that are working out there? It's all about accountability and responsibility. And it's the same kind of government program that you talked about earlier that possibly you don't like them. It's the same thing. Just because it's county, city, doesn't mean it needs to be looked at seriously. Look at all the holidays they already got. Then they get a bonus day. And then if you take 248 hours a year for a vacation, my question to you on that is when, where's the threshold? When does everybody get 248 hours of vacation pay in their term of service? It's accrued one day every month that you work. So up until that, and if you use it, then it continues to accrue up until 248 hours. It doesn't mean you can use 248 hours in a year. I'm not saying that, but I do understand what you're saying. Uh, how much vacation would that total at the end of the year? How many days? If you take 248 and divide it by eight, would that give us the amount of days? 248 divided by however many days that they work. And 248 would be equal to eight hours of vacation. So they could accrue 248 hours in a year? No. How many years are we talking here? What would that, what would take that? I don't have a calculator. I, I would have to do that on a calendar. Well, if it's 10 days, it's 80 hours. If it's 20 days, it's 160. If it's 40 days, it's 320. Okay. So we're looking at 30, 30 days vacation a year or, or whatever it takes to accumulate it. They wouldn't be able to earn 30, 30 vacation days in a year. They, they would only be able to one, earn 12. One day a month, right? 12 days of vacation. So 12 days a year, which is 96 hours. So... Is that now that's on vacation pay or sick pay? That's vacation. Vacation pay. Okay. But the sick pay is how many days? 12. 12. It's the same as vacation. Why would it be any different though than the state mandate? So if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh let's look at it from the top down as opposed to from the bottom up in this case. And the top down would be uh, what what happens if you disagree with the with the union on this? What, could you take us through the process of what happens if we say, no, we're not going to accept this? Um, we would continue to negotiate. And after a year, if we re reached an impasse, then it would go through perk mediation. Okay. And the mediation is something I'm sure you keep an eye on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so uh what is the possible outcome of going going through mediation um they would 
try to help the county and the guild reach an agreement. And if we can't reach an agreement, then typically you go back to the bargaining table and it's a long process, but ultimately we could unilaterally implement what the has the contract stands as it is, which this language has been in the contract for a long time. I did not understand the last thing. What can be done unilaterally? We would just implement how the contract is. There would be no pay increases, that sort of thing. But as the contract is built with, you know, the vacation sick leave, all of that's been built for years. I was um, under the impression we would end up at some point in arbitration. That's for interest arbitration groups. That's only interest, not mm -hmm. these other Correct. terms. Hmm. So that would be if we said 3% increase is fine, but they said, no, we want eight, that could end up in arbitration. Just mediation. Oh, just in mediation. And what's the outcome of that? If we said three best and final, we would could eventually unilaterally implement the three. I see. Who, uh, if you're, if you're in mediation, or arbitration when you're dealing with the union contracts. Are you the one that's negotiating the deal? At that point in time, we would have our labor attorney. So are you present in these meetings with your labor attorney on the negotiations? Yes. And, and you're doing it for the county employees? I represent the county. You represent, I know you're in the risk manager's office. I'm in human resources. Yes. Hey, oh, HR. You're Jessica? Or? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so, so she regularly touches base with us. We set the parameters by which she negotiates. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she's negotiating on our behalf as uh, we have 10 different labor unions that our 600 employees have been divided up into. And so there's, there's quite a bit of negotiations. They're all kind of separate. But of course, we try to to get a sense of unanimity in, in as many of the contracts as possible, because otherwise you get into that battle where the, the unions, you know, kind of counter each other and, and uh, put the price up. But, is but there... the interesting thing is that the, the starting base is not zero. The starting base is whatever the state requires, right? In, you know, in, in a lot of, for example, the, the hours that you can accrue. Yeah, so right. basically, for example, we would never be able to go under one hour for every 40 hours worked. Yeah, but I, I think the gentleman has a very good question. It's not landing on your desk, actually. It's landing on our desk. Yeah. And uh, I'm not... I was laboring under the impression that we had no choice on a lot of these issues because I thought it would go to arbitration. That's why I went down that route. And that we would get a mandate that says, you will do this. And uh, it's been explained to me before that if we go in there and we had agreement, we could agree with the union at say 5%, but we went to arbitration on other issues, including the interest rate that we might end up having to pay 8% if the arbit. Uh, so that would be for our interest arbitration groups, which would be our Sheriff Deputies Guild and our Corrections Officers and Sergeants groups. Those are the folks that the state has declared have no right to strike. Correct. Right. My question is, Jessica, you, you are an HR, but you represent the county, correct? How do we well, just time out for a second? Because if you want questions on this specific contract, I'm more than happy to entertain. But it sounds like we're starting to get into how Jessica does her job, and and no, how Jessica just does her job is is part of this group up here. That's if you incorrect. Have questions on that, then you can ask us on it. But okay, but then I will stop. We're not going to grill Jessica on how she does her job because that's really our purview. Okay, then I will. And, it, and then you need, we got other people that want to talk. So I'm going to put a time limit on, on you today for this specific topic. If, uh, if we have the county representing the county, it's not a good call when it's in mediation and labor contracts. You have to have an, a total 
uh, outside mediator that represents the taxpayers. When you have somebody under the umbrella of the county that gets paid by the county that negotiates these type of contracts, that's ridiculous. So I don't know what your take is on it, Mr. Dahl, but uh, maybe you can elaborate about that. We represent the taxpayers. That's why these contracts come through us. So we're, we're, we're the buffer between these people that sit out here and what, what they, they get paid. And we look at those contracts and uh, we have to compare them to what we're seeing around, just like a, a regular business does. Uh, where I used to work, they would, they would look what other financial institutions are doing and make sure we weren't way out of line. We do the same thing. We do that as a, as a board up here. I don't care if it's uh, uh, where you used to work. It's a conflict of interest, literally, to have the county representing county employees and negotiating a contract within the county. Even if you do work for supposedly the constituents of Cowlitz County, if you got six days sick leave and the state of Washington mandated, they don't need any more than the private taxpayer that pays their bill. There's people in private enterprise that get that and more. Microsoft, sure, they got the money to do it. No. But why? Places right in Longview. I can, I can think. I still say it's a major conflict of interest, and it's not proper for the taxpayers to have to carry that burden on their back. Yeah. But I we seem to butt heads conflict. anyway. Next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate the position that you three gentlemen are in, myself and yourself. I am friends with a great many of law enforcement officers. They are not paper pushers that deserve maybe lower days. I have had friends that have had plates put in their heads. They've had bullets put in their bodies by criminals they're chasing. They've had to go into unsafe situations that no one would want to. And you're expecting them to be treated like paper pushers? I don't think so. These gentlemen and gentle ladies deserve the very best that our county can give them. We need to be comparable with other counties. I'm sure that you are taking care of that as well. So that we get the finest to working in our community. These people are above the paper pushers that we have that are we're giving the other lower perhaps lower vacation days they are unique individuals they deserve what they get thank you just just so we're clear this one this particular group is uh records and support positions it's not the officers i beg to differ paper pushers I don't even know where that even comes into the subject matter. It's all about the private taxpayer having to pay the burden of the taxes, which I've heard up here many times. And uh, you do it on other things, but you're willing to sell anybody out because it's a county setting. Uh, I have friends that are law enforcement officers, and I'm here today in regards to law enforcement for the public meeting, and maybe she might want to stay, stick around. Uh, you don't give money to any county, city, or local agencies above and beyond the taxpayer people that the working man, period. Now, and you shouldn't have the county negotiating the own county's contracts. You guys all talk about the legislature and Congress voting in their own raises. You're doing the same thing at this level. It's wrong. Period. And that's what you got to entertain. You just don't keep passing the buck and we keep moving on to the same thing. And then the, the bigger the government, the bigger the problem. You're feeding sir, the government. Sir, the law allows employees to organize unions to negotiate contracts. Absolutely. Okay, so they have their unions that negotiate on their behalf. We have an HR department that negotiates on our behalf as employers. That's the way it works. I'm not sure what you're talking about, this conflict of interest, because we're not negotiating our own salaries. 
In fact, the salaries that are set for county commissioners, just for information, is set by us. We set a, the salary level that was uh, pegged to a, a percentage of the superior court judges' wages, 50%, I think it was. Arn and I voted on that. Yeah. We are not collecting that. Right. Until we face the voters again. That's that, you know, that election happens this fall. So I'm not sure what you mean by conflict of interest. You might have a disagreement on the settlement that we've come up with, and that's that's fair. I mean, obviously, but we're required by state law to collectively bargain in good faith. Absolutely. And if you start off by saying you get nothing. Well, no, you don't do that. I've, I've been involved. Well, in union. you got to have a negotiations. You're going to have both sides. Right. We're one side represented by our very talented HR director and the unions hire their own. And you bet they also bring their lawyers in and negotiate on their, on their behalf. And if we need to, we have, we have lawyers that come in to protect the interest of well, Dallas my, County. I don't know of another situation under the law that you can have in the negotiations. My main point is if you're a longshoreman or if you're a union electrician, okay and you have a union contract, when you go into mediation for uh, negotiations, you don't have a, you don't have a, it's you. You don't have a county employee that's paid by the county do the negotiations for the county employees that they're doing, have an arbitration with. It's, it's separate entities. It's an employer on this side of the table and it's an employer uh, of, of employee on this side of the table, the union. Okay. And so it's a union and in, uh, signatory companies to that union. They have mediation and arbitration about what they're going to do. And, and it goes to arbitration if they can't make sense of it. And we're, and, w and if it goes that far, that mediation has two sides, the employee's side and the employer's side, that's Callis County, the employer, that's how that works. But the, when you say that about exactly what you're saying, mm -hmm. the thing is here. Now, she, you're not confusing that that Ms. Warren, as our employee, is in a union. She is not. No, She's I'm not. Event, that okay. has no bearing. So it's, I'm not sure where you, I, 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 I don't understand. It's Jessica on the payroll with the county. We all are. Yes. Is the county sheriff's department on the payroll? But the course. county, of course, that's my point. When you have them all together doing it, you could get improper. It's OK, we'll do it because it just gets passed on when you have separate entities, which it should be because the, the, it's the county. It's the same as Congress. What do you it's mean by se separate? I don't I don't understand. What do you mean by separate entities? How can you have more than two, in, I was in two sides on a negotiation? Okay, when I was in the union in Seattle. Nobody from. Uh, there, there's not, there's not one part to the whole negotiations, which there truly is in this. It's all county. We have an employer side, true, and we have an employee side that's signatory with the union, signed in with the union and pays dues. Here, in the county, you have only the county doing everything within the county under the county umbrella and paid by the county. That's what I'm talking about. So would it be more understanding to say that, oh, well, we're all in this together. Go ahead. Let's give them another six days. Let's give them another 4% raise. Let's give them another whatever, because it's all still under the county umbrella. Out in the real world, it's under two different umbrellas, and they both put their gloves on and figure out what they're doing, and that's how it's settled. You guys are doing it all under one table. It's the same thing I brought up to you before. You don't have the sheriff's clerks under the sheriff because they all work together. They all culminate. And, and, and that's the problem. That has to be rectified to have a more proper type of business under government and law. You guys all have said it. He said it. They all pass their own pay raises. If you do it this way, you're doing the same thing at the local level. And I don't have anything against law enforcement. I have law enforcement friends. 
I don't, I don't care what it is, but it's got to be done right. That can show a bias, and that's how it works. You don't do that in the real world. Go up to Seattle and meet with the unions up there. It doesn't happen that way. Mr. Chairman, if I could help, I, I, there's a, a lot of value in what you've said. Uh, I would explain the conflict of interest in the following uh, way there. In the private world, whenever the union goes out on strike, the manager, management has a lot at stake too. They lose, everybody loses because you're not producing anything. Absolutely. And so it's one where you stare at each other in the eye and see who can who can best the other one, realizing that you're hurting yourself at the same time. In the public service employee unions, there is no such counterbalance. If our costs go up too high, we go and ask them. We raise our taxes, and they have to pay. So I think it is imbalanced. Now... Uh, I think it, I think even FDR addressed this way back a long time ago now. I don't remember the numbers, but I this kind of thing has has kind of puzzled and bothered me for a long time also. I uh, used to know the numbers, the private the participation in private company employee unions, has gone from the uh, like the 1980s it's gone straight down you're talking the, the market share uh, the percentage of employees who are in the union yes, has absolutely. gone straight straight down down to a point where it's in single digits somewhere today public service employees have done just the opposite with a more steep climb than the decline on the Right. So it's there's an issue there, and most people have known, and I, I, I'm this is this really amounts to hearsay at this point is employee em, employment in in a public in a public sector is typically prized because of the benefits and the longevity. And so uh you, the issue you're trying to point out, I think, is real. What to do about it, I don't know. I know it's beyond me. It may be beyond the board. I just don't know. But do you understand what the relationship I'm trying to make here in regards to Congress and what we've all talked about and said, well, they vote in their own raises. They vote in their own health care. They vote in their... This is the same thing. You know how much crap I take for trying to take a stand along those lines? Well... Yeah, but what do we do about it, gentlemen? Because it's real. And it all starts at the local level. And the only thing you can fix is your local areas. And if everybody concentrated on fixing it instead of just passing it, then if every local, Lewis County, Cowlitz County, Thurston County, and every, and every state did the same thing, it might fix the problem they're talking about that's happening in D.C., but they don't look at it in that perspective. Sometimes you have to fix it from the bottom up. You know, uh, all I know is no city or government employee should ride on the back and benefit better than the hardworking folks in the state of Washington. And that's, and that's for sure. That anytime you have commingling of people and then they're negotiating their deals amongst themselves, whether it's an individual department, but it's still under the umbrella, is not healthy. And you'll never get good resolve from that, except more problems. Sorry, any other? Okay, I don't see any other. Well, we had, did we have a motion? We have a motion hey, on the floor, right? Oh, is there a motion? No.
Well, I'll... was there? There was a motion on the floor. Okay. There, there is the motions on the yeah, floor. Yeah. You made it. <laughs> so, call for a vote. Those in favor? Oh, that's right. Thank Aye. you. <laughs> Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Jessica. Real quick before we open up public comment tomorrow uh, at our one thirty meeting, there's a bid opening for the Eric Creek Fish Passage. If you have any interest in that, two thirty the uh, Callets Wakayakum Council of Governments will be in talking about metropolitan planning area. If you have any interest in in that, that'll be two thirty tomorrow. And then next Wednesday at 2.30, we have a discussion on lodging, sales tax, and reserve, just kind of a accounting of what's in that. So, um, Mr. Chairman, you, you used the term metropolitan planning area, and that's associated with the Council of Governments. But that is that is what the, uh, the Council of Government um, performs in reviewing the awarding of state and federal highway construction projects, transportation related projects. Now, there's some language in the federal law that requires the grants that local governments receive to be reviewed by a metropolitan group, a regional group. And our metropolitan area is sometimes referred to as the Longview metropolitan area, but it's Longview, Kelso and Rainier defined by the Census Bureau. And so um, the Council of Government acts as the board of directors for this metropolitan planning area. He'll get into more detail on that. But um, earlier in this meeting, you heard about a bid opening for uh, Eric Creek, uh, which is a, a subsidiary, I mean, a tributary of, of uh, Abernathy Creek. And there's a fish barrier passage that's partially funded by federal dollars that had to be approved by this metropolitan planning area. So it's very, it's not very well known and yet it performs a pretty vital function for road departments, yeah, cities and counties all over the state. They all have different metropolitan planning areas. Yeah. So the, this, Because I listened to his presentation down at Woodland Council, I know he wants to talk about expanding that countywide versus just how it is now so that's the discussion tomorrow with that a, a quick question i'm trying yeah, yeah. to find it uh the first meeting at 1 30 is likely not to last as long as the hour well i think will you start it at 2 30 yeah we don't have quick, a work yeah, my so suggestion so. yeah okay so I, I I won't be here tomorrow, but oh, so you miss the festivities? I, I miss them, and I did want to I did want to see the one at two thirty for sure. But it's one of those things where I've never quite understood a lot of that. Yeah. Well, like I said, I know it, the discussion is around expanding that countywide. So yeah, if you have comments on stuff on that. Right? Who is driving it? Uh, Bill will be over. Bill Fashy. Okay. No, he's presenting, but is he's he driving presenting. it? Also? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's your meeting. Good morning. Uh, this... Uh, I hadn't uh, planned to say anything about or talk about this, but this this uh, difference between the growth in the public sector unions and the private sector, uh, there is something to that, and I'm I'm kind of puzzled. Probably like we all are, you know what what do we do about that? Uh, we do know that the people that create the wealth in the country come from the private sector; they don't come from the public sector. Those are service jobs, obviously needed and everything else. But I don't, I can't tell you the number of times that I've I've talked to 
uh, private contractors are out doing work alongside and similar work to the public sector unions. And the total difference in productivity between the private sector people would have to make, you know, have to <laughs> held accountable or otherwise they get fired versus what some of the public sector unions perform is quite a bit different. So um, I think we understand that, and I don't know exactly how we go about dealing with it, but I think the gentleman does bring up a good point that, uh, yeah, the private, uh, the, the public sectors are growing and the private sectors are shrinking, and I think we got it backwards somehow. So no words of wisdom, just kind of a thought. Yeah, I, I, to just kind of echo Arn's point, I think, and I'm using round numbers here. We have around 600 employees in the in the county. I think 400, a little over 400, are represented by unions. But it's a high percentage and, and different than what you'd see out yeah, in yeah, the private. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate him coming up and saying that because it is a it is a major concern and it has to be taken serious. And when we hear from you guys, and I don't have anything against any of you personally, but what are we going to do with it? Or we don't know what to do with it. Or we have to either you guys have to do uh, uh, a networking amongst all counties and say, we need to put a stop to this. Somebody has to put the big boy pants on and really go after it. If we're going to truly put it in place, we can't complain about the top if we're not doing it at the bottom. I think one of the, one of the challenges that you are um, talking about is how the state law sets up the whole framework of you can you can form unions, you can collectively bargain, and in fact, we'll actually start with minimum wages and you know minimum uh, accrual of vacation and all those kinds of things. <clears throat> so when you when you talk about making changes, the changes have to be with that state law that provide that framework for collective bargaining, and. I'm not sure the state representatives that we elect from Callitz County um, are not advocating for those kinds of changes already. It's the rest of the state, once again, that imposes um, their, their wishes through the legislature. Um, you have to be able to change the makeup of the legislature. That means somehow getting involved in elections outside of Callas County. And that's that's very, very difficult to do. So, I mean, we we have six legislators that represent Callas County, uh, the two legislative districts, they're all Republicans. And, you know, they got, understand that, that dynamic. There aren't a whole lot of public sector unions that endorse Republicans. And so there's there's that, you know, they they support and get elected legislators that support their their union rights. At the you say it starts at the local level. It starts at the state legislature level, and that's right, right. incredibly complicated for us down here in Southwest Washington to have much of an impact, unless you're willing to go to other counties and work on campaigns and get others uh, you know, change the, the election results again that's very expensive in time and and, and money yeah but uh, we don't have a result if we don't do something and it's like a fish ladder uh dennis if you don't go speak to these senators and these congress folks and the representatives of the state of washington about the problems and 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 even the constituents have to do this mm -hmm. we don't get anywhere but worse and that's what we've seen. We're all about the same age here and and maybe a little older, but 
are we really here to fix the problem or just pass the rest of our days? I don't want to say that that would be the right thing to do. And uh, so, I mean, it. I, I just, well, you have to do something about it. And, and also the complacency, like this gentleman here was saying about uh, productivity. Well, if they don't have the productivity in the county, they just hire a couple more people. And uh, a prime example, I'll mention a throw-in thing. My buddy lives in Kent up on the hill. He says he goes down the hill every day and all the county workers are sitting in the truck, sitting there by the park. Four, five, six of them, just hanging out. He'll come back up the hill at the end of the day after he's done his job. And they're still doing the same thing, collecting the pay. We have so much abuse. And like Arnie was saying earlier in regards to the Phoenix house and and I think the Phoenix House is a great thing. We have to keep after that kind of problem. But any government program, and we got to look at the county as being a government program. We got to look at the city as another government program, whether it's a city program. If they aren't truly have major oversight, we are losing millions and trillions of dollars throughout the country because it's allowed to be done. They vote in their raises. They get their vacation pay. They get their retirements that are unbelievable. And I think some of their uh, medical insurance is carried forward from the date they retire all the way to their Social Security draw on their Medicare and uh, Social Security deal. Private sector don't get that. The only ones that I can say honestly get that is, and this was been years ago, and I can't say they do today, is your auto industry. They got a lot of perks because there's a lot of value and a lot of money there. Um, but that's not, I could see that being just like Microsoft, like I said, when they have that kind of money, but that's their money. That's the business's money that can give it away like that because Bill Gates earned it. The county isn't and doesn't and should not be set up on that kind of meal ticket and uh, that, that's in, in that regards so uh i came up here to speak about something other than this but i wanted to go back to him back to the and 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 i'll be forthright with you and honest with you folks i came here with a little bit of chip on my shoulder this morning because yesterday when I was on the freeway on Interstate 5, coming back from Castle Rock, Fiber Credit Union, all right, I got on the on-ramp at exit 49, and, and I think the, the folks in this area that live here, all of you, know where exit 49 is, which is Spirit Lake Highway and, and goes down into Castle Rock. I was headed northbound back to the RV park where I live. Well... I had gotten on the freeway and it was before the bridge northbound, which the bridge I'm talking about is the bridge that crosses the Toodle on I-5, where the Toodle comes down into the Columbia. The gentleman that I have a restraining order against cut me off on the freeway coming from the center lane and I'm on the slow lane. I call law enforcement and he, he did it deliberately and uh, I'll tell you that what what i heard from them they said oh well it's on interstate five we're gonna have to refer you to the state patrol state patrol says oh no we don't do that Callis county's in charge of that and i know why i got referred because they do know my name down at the dispatch okay well then so i uh and sure enough it was that gentleman wherever he was coming from i have no idea because i didn't see him until he cut me off and i had to hit my brakes and get out of the way swerve to the side so I call, I'm speaking with law enforcement, and they say, okay. So I ended up with the state troopers. Well, that didn't work out. And, they, and I said, we need to do something about this. And uh, so she said she was going to call them. Well, I never heard anything. So I called back to sheriff's department. Then I get a young lady it's, that's an officer, and I don't know her name fully, Danziel or something, whatever. She goes, okay, well, I'll come out or uh, make contact or whatever with him. And I'm going, you need to get out here. 
this is enough. And uh, so I sat out waiting outside with my new lab pup. And lo and behold, there was another gentleman across the street in a black pickup. His name was Pete. He was waiting on the sheriff's department for a vagrant that's been hanging around up there due to that space age. So I chatted with him a little bit. Well, nobody ever came for either one of us. I called back and I said, what is the story here? And so I got a call back from that deputy on my phone. She said, uh, oh, Mr. Johnson, yeah, I spoke with him on the phone. And uh, he said that, uh, yeah, he he did uh, he did pull in front of you and, and whatever, but he had another occupant with him, which is his girlfriend, the other drug addict that has lied numerous times and that drives the golf cart down Jackson Highway without any police doing anything about it. So now during our conversation, I told her, I said, he did this deliberately to, to intimidate, threaten, and instill fear in my life. And he came within 25 feet of my vehicle. He didn't have to come out of the center lane northbound and cut me off on the slow lane. Why? It was before the bridge on the northbound I-5. If he's getting off at exit 52, you have more than a mile and a half up the road or better to get off. She goes, and this is what caught it. And I called back dispatch after this because I was speaking to her on the phone. She goes, well, Mr. Johnson, he said he saw you getting on the on-ramp at I-5 exit 49. Then why would you even try to make contact with me? Why would you try to cut me off on the slow lane except for to threaten, intimidate, and instill fear? She, so I called dispatch immediately back and I said, this lady is sitting here telling me that there's, she's got to have 51% of proof. And, and he had the other occupant, which it, she didn't say the name. And then I said, Jody Palmer. Uh, I said, uh, you mean the drug addict that has lied to the cops numerous times? And they lied in court and lost with an attorney. And then the law enforcement don't do anything about this. And she says that. Douglas Ralph Hatley Jr. that has a restraining order against him in Cowlitz County saw me getting on the freeway and then pulls in front of me deliberately. And they ain't going to do anything about it? No. That's why I said, and I told dispatch I was going to be here today. Brad Thurman is an absolute fraud in our community. And I'm surprised no officers haven't been killed under his authority because he does not do his job whatsoever. And remember one thing, Troy Brightfield, Bright, Bright, Bright Bill, the one that said judges are new in this community and can't write restraining orders, is an absolute fraud too. And Officer Handy, that sat back here and talked to Miss Joanna Barnhart, 74 years today, and asked her how to investigate the criminals at that park. He goes, can we look them up on Google? I want to say it again. These people get promoted in our county positions. Officer Handy, I read their little Facebook website. It was an absolute joke. Do these people even know what they're doing? Not everybody has interaction with law enforcement. The interaction I've had, I see no good with what's going on. We've, if you look around in the communities, it's all over the country. The young lady that was in here talking about how the cops are, you know, better than the paper, paper pushers, those are the people that got the wrong idea. They don't comprehend. They're still human beings. They kill people. They murder people. They beat their wives. They beat their children or they rape their children. This is a problem in our community. This happened to me yesterday. I'm going over to see the judge today. Fill out a request and meet with him. But... If you have Officer Handy asking a 74-year-old woman, can I look those guys up on Google? And then he gets promoted? That's idiocracy. That's And then you give them a raise today? This is my point, guys. I was kind of surprised to hear, you know, the county getting more contract raises and the sheriff's clerk's deal. And it can't work this way. And I'm sorry that I've had to have this interaction with law enforcement, but I have. But it isn't about my statements against me. 
It's against these people. And I know this is beating a dead horse here, folks. But that trial I had, that shouldn't have been a trial that I won with their attorney representing this delinquent. Um, and why did we have a trial? I have no idea. But the county, I, I, I wish we could really get to the bottom of that. Restraining orders don't go to a three and a half hour trial. Restraining orders don't get a judge that uh, I wasn't expected to get, but got him because I tried to recuse the other one. And I got a three and a half hour trial and I beat Craig McCreary, which lied. Craig McCreary of Longview, Washington, lied in that courtroom. And I will hope he hears me. And he, he's more than welcome to come and try to sue me because I'll bring the paperwork in and the transcripts for that court. And he can sit there and say what he said. And then I want to ask him, I want to see how you prove that. We have the same thing with Brad Thurman. He says he has all confidence in his police officers. Well, has any, has any officers died under his supervision? Because with his, with his supervision, I could see it happening. Absolutely. And I hope he's not uh, uh, happy with me because we've been dealing with this for 14 months and officer Brad Thurman has no clue. He had no clue when we met him on November 14th, 2023 at 1 10 in the afternoon. And he has no clue today. Any others? I do want to end the meeting with a little bit of optimism. I think some of us in the room are old enough to remember a fellow named Bob Williams. Um, I used to work with him many, many years ago at Weyerhaeuser, and another, one of the good guys that I worked with at Weyerhaeuser, and then he went on to be a district uh, representative for, I don't know, Dennis, how many, how many terms was Bob there? Three, four, something like that. Yeah, I think about four or five terms. Yeah, yeah. Time. So he was a good guy. And then, then, he, he, did, then, like, he, then he ran for governor. Governor, yep, yeah. yep. Um, but the point that I wanted to make is we talk about how to deal with some of these problems. It was Bob Williams after he co-founded the Freedom Foundation that took the teachers unions of Washington State all the way to the Supreme Court and won. And it had to do with what the unions were using dues for. Um a per certain percentage of it, political activism. So we, there are things that we can actually do to start turning some of these things around at the local level. It may not necessarily come from the government, but it could be some of those types of operations. So yeah, there, there are vehicles out there to start turning some of these things around. I think his, his foundation's still around, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was the Evergreen Freedom Foundation. Now it's the Freedom Foundation. And by the way, Glenn Morgan used to work for Bob Williams there. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. As always, we appreciate you coming by and participating. We uh, will adjourn. <laughs>